Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's Testing Tactics webinar series. Today's topic is best practices and techniques for cable fault location. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the digital marketing analyst for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that will be popping up on the screen momentarily. Uh, you can submit questions at any time by pressing, oh, hey, uh, Joseph, can you cycle through to the next slide for me, bud? We have some technical stuff popping around. Bear with mm -hmm. us for a second, guys. There we go. There we are, yeah. All right, so one slide in, we'll see our Q&A uh, box that you can enter in questions at any time, and I will be asking them to our panelists during our Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, a certificate of attendance, a copy of this presentation, and a link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is Joseph Aguirre, Applications Engineer. To assist with that question and answer session, we will also have joining us Jason Aaron, Applications Engineer, and Glenn Wall, Applications Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us today, Joseph. Anytime. All right, so hello, my name is Joseph Aguirre. I'm an Applications Engineer here at Megger. During this webinar, we will discuss the best practices in cable fault locating. So for the agenda today, we have a brief safety overview to begin with, followed by the different types of cables, the different types of faults on cables, then a cable fault locating process, and finally the summary. First things first, with Megger, we always say follow your established company's work procedures, meaning uh, if you have to wear gloves or use a hot stick to make any connections, do so. If you have to use just gloves, or just hot stick or the combination of both. So also ensure that the cable is de-energized and grounded before connecting any equipment. What this does is it eliminates the potential for any operating voltage. If you're on the wrong cable itself, you, you'd know because the other end is already grounded. So you remove the ground to start your testing. And also that if you have any backbeat on there as well, that can be dissipated. You also have to be aware of induced voltages by any cables running parallel by it, and also be mindful that the test equipment itself has capacitors and internal DC storage, so that is also a potential for high voltage. Next, we're going to be moving to cables. This is a cable. This is a, a similar cable that most people use. First, first things uh, first things first. You have your center conductor. In this case, it's aluminum. Then you have your conductor shield or your semicon, and then you have your insulated medium right there, which is EPR in this case. Then you have your next insulation shield, and then you have your metallic shield or concentric neutral. Finally, you have your outer jacket of the insulation if you do have one. These are your three different types of cables. You have an EPR, which is a polymer blend. It's easier to turn, it's easier to pull, but it does have a lower dielectric strength. As well on you have your uh, XLPE, which the material itself is excellent dielectric strength, has high insulation resistance, and has a low dissipation factor itself. But it is limited by the temperature range on it. Uh, then you have your paper insulated lead or your pelt cable. This right here, it has different layers of insulation impregnated with oil. It is harder to arc reflect. You may need to use the ICE method, which we'll go over later on. Finally, you have your three phases. And so on this one right here, as you can see, you have individual shields on each cable. That's ideal for fault locating, because if it did fault out, it's going to go face to ground in most case. And so you'll get a cleaner uh, shot of it, and you can go face to ground on each one. If you look at this one over here, you just see how they share one. And the, the disadvantages to this, if this goes face to ground, you, you can get it pretty close right here. But if they went face to face, you'll also have to go face to ground, face to ground, face to ground, and then hit each face to face as well to make sure, because you did have a fault. You know, you know that you're on the correct cable, but you want to ensure that you're covering the fault. So it might have been a face to face fault, so you have to check it this way, and you also have to check it to the actual ground itself. 
there, there's different types of neutrals. Each one has its own perk as well. So you have a stranded concentric. You have the shielded and unshielded version of your uh, your stranded. So the shielded version is a lot better because it's not going to corrode as easy as your unjacketed. And then your tape shield. If you do have a tape shield, those are really good. But over time, you can build up uh, corrosion in between oxidation in between the the actual uh, tape shield itself, which in itself, when you run a TDR shot, can make the actual length seem longer than what it is because the actual tape shield insulation itself is about twice the distance as the actual cable length, how they're overlapped. So on your different voltage classes, classes, you need to know this whenever you're doing your cable fault locating because you need to know how much voltage you can output onto your cable. So if you think about it, a typical 15 kV cable gets about 8.6 kV. And these are built to withstand. And so whenever your cable faulted, you know that it is around operating temperature because it was in service when it failed. So in nine times out of 10 of the cases, you typically have a pin, uh, a pinhole fault. And what that does is there's a gap in the insulation right there, which it can uh, arc over itself. And so you have to actually overcome the thickness of the insulation where that little air gap is. And that's how you can get it to flash over to your concentric neutral. So for underground cable, which is typically XOP or EPR, it's almost never uh, paper insulated because paper insulated are typically in downtown areas. They have branch networks and they're also in conduits and not direct burial in most parts. So most, since, uh, most systems for direct burial cable for underground is 15 kV to 35 kV. They're typically in loops, sometimes in radial feeds. And these are really good for point to point because it's just going from point A to point B and no branches, which is really ideal for the TDR. With your, with your under, underground cables, you have uh, chances of water ingress. So that right there will make water trees, which is just, just concentrated water in the plastic of the cable. And this will cause electrical trees over time, which can create your fault. And then your and underground cables, they must be located, dug up, so you have to splice them or you have to pull a whole new cable, depending on which. Going over to faults, when a cable fails, it's considered faulted. So that is what a fault is. So you're in service and then you're taken out of service for whatever reason. So what causes the fault? It could be anything. It could be just your insulation fails just from uh, transient over voltages. It could be a dig in like this excavator here in the picture. It could be a physical short uh, between the conductor and the shield itself where they're physically touching each other. It could be a pinhole in the insulation or you can have a complete separation of conductor meaning that let's say it's an aluminum cable with a high fault current, it actually physically melted the cable in two. So in that essence, you don't have one cable, you have two cables. Or it could be corrosion in the shield, meaning that over time, the unjacketed uh, concentric neutral just rotted and corroded over time where it's no longer viable and you don't have not even one strand connected to each other. So you, don't, you have an open on the actual concentric neutral or shield. And you heard me mention about pinholes a little bit ago. This is about, like I said, nine times out of 10, this is typically what you want to get. On 15 kV cable, you typically have anywhere between four to eight kV is where the breakdown occurs. When I say breakdown occurs, that means if you're doing any testing on it and you do a high pot test, it's typically anywhere between four to eight kV where the breakdown happens. So these are really high, high uh, impedance faults. So the resistance fat, uh, path on it on the ground is a large comparison between the cable surges and impedance. So the best way to look at this is if the, <clears throat> the, the center conductor here, as you can see, is right in the middle. And what happens is while it was under load or actually online, it's actually coming out here and then shorting, you're making an electrical short right here to your concentric neutral or your shield. And that's what the pinhole happens, and that's how we also use our other technology of arc reflection, which we'll go over in a little bit. 
The other scenario that I mentioned earlier was your open conductor. As I said as well, it's mostly common in aluminum cables. That's because the fault current's so high that it physically melts it in half and you have two separate cables at that point. The disadvantage to this type of fault is the TDR, if you're testing this way, it can only see up to here because you have two cables in this point. So you may not be able to thump or to arc reflect, especially if the concentric is physically touching the center conductor, then you know that you cannot do it because you have a direct short, which completes the, the circuit. And like I said before, you need that little bit of air gap to arc across. And like I was saying, as soon as it physically touches, as you can see in here, it's just melted down where the point where the concentric neutral is actually touching. And so it's actually physically shorted. <clears throat> and a couple of examples on that is if someone had to drive ground and they drove the ground uh, deep into the earth and it actually penetrated a cable to the point of failure, or it's kind of like the excavator that we saw earlier. So these are really low resistance faults. The TDR should be able to see it. And whenever when I say should be able to see it, it can't see past that point because you'll see a direct short. It'll pop up, it'll flag it as a short. And also remember that you cannot thump because it's not going to produce a noise because it's directly touching each other and you cannot arc reflect. So another key indication that you have a direct short like this is if you're trying to high pipe and it's not building any voltage, but you see the milliamps creep up. So that could give you a good indication that you have a direct short and you'll have to use a different means of fault locating. Speaking of fault location, first things first, we'll go over the locate cable and by locate cable i mean to actually physically trace out the fault location because you don't know where the cable is actually going so all this does is uh, you help avoid pitfalls so as you can see here we have the cable reel that goes here it hits the manhole goes to the left but if you have if you do your arc reflection from here and it says 500 foot you see a pad mount here you didn't realize that there's another pad mount going over this way and you walk it off 500 foot and you're listening and you can't hear anything because the cable actually bent over because you didn't have it prints to look at or you didn't just trace the cable fault. So this is an optional step, but I personally highly recommend it. The way that you do this is you have a frequency generator right here. You output high frequency pulses onto the actual cable itself. And then you have a wand pickup and that wand picks up on the high frequencies and you sweep it over the cable path and then that way you can mark that true cable path and so whenever you're doing the fault locating process you'll actually be able to pinpoint it a lot quicker than guessing where the cable is next we're going to do high pot but before we do high pot i want to go over a couple of connection points especially on our equipment as well this should be true on all the others you have your equipment ground here and what you want to do is have your equipment ground closest to the ground rod as possible. So if you're in a pad mount, I understand sometimes there's a lot of debris sometimes in there, ant pile, uh, spider webs, just get as close as possible to the ground. And that gives you a good, a good source to ground. So if there's any flashover that comes back on the return, you remember how we were talking about it flashes back over to the concentric, the concentric's tied to the return, and it goes back internally, which I'll show you in a moment and it bleeds back off the ground that way. So after you have your first connection made up for your ground, then you'll go to your high voltage return, which is here. You want to put this as close to the elbow as possible. And what that does is it helps eliminate any other signals that may be coming off of the ground here. And it gets you closest to the actual cable itself, which gives you a better TDR reading. Followed by then you need to connect your high voltage output lead here onto the actual cable under test and with mega if you if you have over five ohms of resistance between one and two here you'll get a f ohm reading which all that all that's indicating is there's five ohms of resistance over here so either this there might be a separation in this right and we're saying that that's not the resistance is too high to help dissipate any uh, voltage flowing through here so it's a safety message and as I said before, we're going to see an internal diagram of the of our thumper, any thumper, they just follow the same basic principle. You have a high voltage power supply here. 
and then you have a switch that could go to surge. So just think of surge as your thumping. And then you have your burn mode right here. So think of that as your high pop. Your high voltage switch and your capacitor, they kind of work hand in hand. So if you're on surge mode, you're going to build your capacitor up, build all the voltage you can. It'll close the high voltage switch, which will output to your high voltage lead. You also have your return. So as you saw in the picture before and slide before, you have your high voltage lead to, uh, connected to your actual cable itself. This is connected to the concentric neutral itself. So whenever you output voltage, it's going to come back on the high voltage return. And that's how you're going to know where your fault distance is, especially on arc reflection. And it's going to dis discharge back to your safety ground. So this will also close the discharge resistor, which will bleed any high voltage off. But later on, we're going to be talking about why you need a high pot. And one reason you want a high pot is because you want to know that the cable is actually faulted. And what I mean by that is a lot of people just want to go up there and just dump the cable and they don't know where the breakover occurred or if the cable is truly faulted yet because it's either going to flash over or not. It's either going to hold the voltage or not. So <clears throat> if you build your capacitor up and it's max voltage that you're going to output, you're going to shoot it on and it's going to be on the cable. So let's say it's 15 kV cable AC and you're putting out 15 DC on this cable. So it can hold this uh, cable voltage. And when, whenever you put, push it out onto the actual cable itself, there's nowhere for it to go because it's not going to flash over back to the return. So this right here is going to close to discharge any voltage on there, but it, it can only discharge as fast as the resistor is going to let it, right? So either the resistor might be overcome or the switch may be overcome. And as you're continuously thumping for 20, 30, 45 minutes on a good cable, it will flash over back into the machine itself. Because I mean, all you're doing is overcoming a small gap. And at that point, you're putting yourself at risk and the equipment at risk for uh, damage and injury. So cable fault locating, the actual objectives, what do you want to do? You want to get this done as safe as possible and as quick as possible in that order. So what you want to do is do it safely so just follow all the proper connections and guidelines you want to do it as quick as possible which which is why we're here so we can discuss about the actual arc reflection method and ice method and the thumping and how to pinpoint but you want to do this while minimizing the damage to the cable what that means is whenever you have an actual flashover point you want to know where that is so you do so you're not having to overstress the cable because if you have a 15 kv cable it flashes over at 5 kV, there's no point of putting 15 kV on the cable, no point of putting 10 kV on the cable. You're just overly stressing the cable with uh, no results, right? You're still getting results, but you're damaging the cable. And that's one reason, if you ever think about it, you have a splice, you spliced it, and then about, you know, a couple years later, maybe a month later, you're having to replace, you're having to re-splice about eight foot away from that splice. It's because you over voltage thump that cable for a long period of time, or you just uh, really just over voltage the cable over and over and over, which actually uh, stress the insulation to a point of failure. As you can see here, you have this flow chart. It's recommended you can do this. A lot of people don't. You could do an insulation test. So, what this does is tell you if there's a low resistance or a high resistance fault. So on our equipment, it will typically tell you what it is whenever you do the DC test. So if it can actually charge the cable itself and output voltage, it's typically a high resistance fault and you have a flashover. If it doesn't and you can't build the voltage or the voltage stops ramping after a few hundred, but it does give you a ohm reading, it's a low resistance fault, letting you know that the actual cable is faulted, but it cannot build any voltage, so it's more than likely shorted already. So we'll go with the nine out of 10 times here for the presentation. So we'll do your DC high pot, which is typically your first test to do. And then we'll do arc reflection. And then after arc reflection, you'll go down to pinpointing. And if it's under something like in a conduit or under a parking lot or a driveway, you may need a audio frequency measurement, which is just another way of saying you need a listening device to actually hear the thump. So as I mentioned just briefly, you have a your cable fault locating 
uh, process, you want to high pot first, and then once it's done, because this will tell you, hey, if it's a quote unquote good or bad. But that's kind of misleading. Yes, it's a go, go, no go test, but sometimes you might not have enough voltage to break over. Uh, this is especially in like paper insulated cables. Sometimes you can have a flash over point and uh, the actual cable itself will self heal itself where it actually will still hold the 12 kV on there and you might have to go up higher than that. So a good rule of thumb is what I typically say is you have a 15 kV voltage class cable, which your RMS is typically 8.7. So if you do 15 times 1.4, 1.414, you get about 12.25, uh, and that would be equal to your RMS on there, right? So if you just go about 15 kV, you'll go a little bit more over this, which is your RMS, which it's built to handle your peak as well. So just a good rule of thumb, just if you're going to cable fault on a cable, know what the actual cable voltage class is, then you can actually input that voltage on that cable. So like I said just a second ago, 15 volt KV uh, cable for AC, put 15 DC on there. You'll typically get a flashover. If not, you overshot this voltage range on DC. And <clears throat> that that kind of gives you a, a better feeling that you hit it with a little bit more over voltage than what RMS requires. And it only held, because it's a short duration test, it's only about five seconds. If it holds it for five seconds, then you know it's not flashed over in that point. So, like I, like I was saying before, this is a DC test and it is ramped voltage. So you're not just automatically boom 15, you're gonna slowly ramp up to it. And I'm gonna show you here in a little bit what that means. So you're gonna slowly ramp up and then it's gonna to get to your voltage. You're either gonna hold the set voltage that you wanted to output or you're not. So it's one of the two. And this right here would tell you a lot of good things of if it's uh, what kind of fault resistance, if it's a low or high fault any of the leakage current dealing with dealing with the low voltage or the uh the low resistance fault and then a flash over for a high resistance fault so all of these you kind of get really good answers just by doing this one test so is it chargeable so yes it, it's holding the charge you know that means it's holding the voltage to flash over that means there's not a direct short so that answers that question if it doesn't then you know there is a short somewhere What's the breakdown voltage? So what that does is verify that, hey, I do have this number and this number is gonna come really good into play for the next two tests. So you know where it flashes over, you can use that number at about one kV, no more than two, to arc reflect and to do your thumping. And that gives you a, the best cleanest results that you can. And so if you do have a high resistance fault, you can use arc reflection and you actually know what the breakdown voltage is, so you can use the numbers like I was talking about. So this right here is a simulation I have embedded in the slide. It's gonna go over the high pot function. So we're gonna high pot, we're gonna say this is a 35 kV cable. We're gonna go about 30 kV, because this is the highest that we can go on this unit. And we're going to stress the cable and see where it flashes over it. So like I said before, this is gonna give you a valuable reading and you can see that it's slowly building. As you can see, I have it ramping slow on this one. That way you can see where it actually flashes over at, and it's, a, it's either gonna hold the voltage all the way to 30. If it does, then you'll hold it for five seconds, and then it's going to tell you no flash over occurred. But as you can tell here, it flashed over at 24 kV, letting you know that this is our number for this test. On this particular cable, on this particular instance, it was 24 kV you might be able to go back and reshoot it again, and it might vary, it might go up to 25, 26, it might be as low as 16, we don't know. So every time you wanna start with high pot and then go on, that way you can know what you actually need to use for your arc reflection and for your thumping. Moving on to TDR. So why do we use a TDR? So a couple of things while we use it is to verify it's the right cable, by verifying it's the right cable, if the other end is still grounded and you connect it and you see your uh, impedance is a downward blip because it's still grounded on the other side when you're connected to the far end of the cable, you'll, you'll see that downward blip letting you know that it's that cable and it's fully going all the way down. So it verifies the correct length as well. So you can remove the ground and it'll, it'll blip back up kind of like what you see here. 
right here, but it's not really showing the cable in. So, but you'll just see a high impedance up here for a cable in, and I'll show you that here in a minute. And it'll also tell you if it's opened or shorted, like I was telling you before, because if once you learn to read the actual signatures itself, the the unit is uh, very nice. You really won't need the software to hand pick it out for you. You can actually read it and tell if the software is being truthful or if it just, because the software is just going to look at a downward blimp. So if it sees this downward right here and it might've been moved out here, it might've picked this up and flagged that as a fault. So you just have to use kind of common sense and not just 100% solely rely on the software itself. And that's on any TDR, any TDR in the industry. And that way you can uh, verify a few things like if your neutral is 100% intact. And it, as I said before, if it's open or shorted. So as I was telling you before, the high end right here, that means there's an open here. And then as you can see here, I have a red one. That just means I use arc reflection in this instant, and the downward blimp is going to be where your fault is. So if this was blue and I just did the straight TDR shot, it will go through and it will be blue this whole time because TDR is only about 60 volts, but it's a high frequency pulse. It will flag it right here saying that there is a short. So this could be where your cable is actually grounded to the uh, other transformer tank on a standoff. Or it could be where the actual center conductor and the uh, the center conductor and the and the shield itself are physically touching each other. And then, as you can see, no flat, uh, no change means that there's nothing. It's just flat here. So, a couple of things about TDR. There's a method behind it, and it uses a velocity factor or the propagation velocity. What that means is it's just a signal pulse that travels down the cable about 60 to 70% of the speed of light. It's affected by numerous things. What what What's the insulation? So is it EPR, is it XLP, is it paper insulated? How thick is the cable? The, the cable insulation itself, how thick is that? So is it 220, 250 uh, mil? What's a, what's a conductor size? Is it number two? Is it two watt? Is it four watt? What, what's the actual conductor? And then the different manufacturers have different, uh, that affects propagation velocity. How many times has it been faulted on? How many times has there been an overvolted situation? There's a lot of different things that come into factor. So nine times out of 10, you never really have to adjust the actual propagation velocity. And I get, and Mega gives a 255 is used as default because that's a pretty good rounded about number for majority of cables as far as EPR and XLPE, and that's for the different voltage classes from 15 to 35. And the reason why we use this, but we also kind of say, do not adjust unless it's over about a thousand foot. And I'll give you a, an instance here. So let's say you have a small 500 foot run. So you're going from point A here to point B, 500 foot, and you can see it. Your print says 500 foot and your propagation's off by a little bit. So if this is off by 10%, the length is going to be off by 10%. So on that shorter run that you're only talking about a few feet. So you might be about 10, 20 foot off of wherever your fault is. So like I said, 500 foot, you have 250 foot where the fault is and you walk it out where you think 250 foot is, but it might be 20 feet this way, but I can still hear it. Where this really comes into play is for really long cables, like at wind farms or over in the mountainous areas where they might have 20 or 30,000 feet. Now that small 10, 20 foot difference here can be 500 foot. So where you're listening for the fault here, the fault might be way down here, 500 foot away. So that's where you kind of need to get this hammered down. So like I was saying uh, before, longer ones you need to change because and uh, larger ones have a slower velocity and everything's measured in uh, feet per microsecond. The number accounts, it goes all the way down and reflects back. That's where the actual time domain reflectometer goes all the way down the cable and then it reflects back and that's how it actually gets its measurement. So it's not really measuring the cable, it's measuring the time it takes for it to go all the way down to the cable then to reflect back. 
And as I was saying, XLPE is about 255. EPR is a little bit slower than that. And paper insulate is a little bit slower than that. But like I said, as long as you're not going in anything over about a thousand foot, this really doesn't pertain much to you. But if it does, what you can do, and if you really have a really good print, you can uh, look at your print and let's say it's a 3000 foot run. When you connect your TDR, you see 2,800 foot and you want to get a little bit closer to that, you can manually adjust the propagation velocity and to get to that 3,000 foot so you can be more accurate on your pinpoint. So <clears throat> these are a couple of different reflectograms, as I was showing you before. So you have your bump up here. So what that means is your center conductor or your concentric neutral and your center conductor is 100% all the way through. So that's your true open, that's the end of the cable where it's stood off. As I was uh, explaining before, the, the short circuit, that's where your concentric neutral is going down, but it's shorted right here, right? Where it's physically touching the center conductor and you can see it there. And that's the, also the same principle. It's either physically touching or it can electrically touch. So if it's electrically touching, that's how you do the arc reflection. But if it's physically touching like this, you cannot do the arc reflection. And then you have your break. So a corroded concentric neutral, that's the break in it. So your open is beforehand, right? So you have the short here, and then you have an open here because you're not all the way through. And then of course your center conductor is going all the way through. And then this is a join or transformer. I like to call it a heartbeat. Some people call it a wiggle. So you just have a high impedance up versus a high impedance down. And the reason why it does that is because as it's traveling down, it goes back and it reconnects and half of the signal goes back and the other half continues on. So the reason why it goes up and down like that is because when you think about it, the actual center conductor is here and then you have your concentric neutral there. And these two are pretty much uniform like this all the way down the cable until you do what? Until you have an actual splice. When you have a splice, you pull the two apart, right? And so that's what makes it go up because you're separating them. And then it comes back down and then goes straight back across. So you have a layer, extra layer of separation here when you didn't, all you had was the, the different insulated mediums here. And then you have your concentric neutral. And that's pretty much what you have here, except for you have an additional layer here, which shows you the difference here. So it's the same concept as going through a transformer. So if the concentric was going on right here, it goes back down to the actual pad mount. The center conductor travels through the transformer, comes back right here and reconnects back to your uh, concentric neutral, back to your ground. So you just have a higher impedance change because these two are far apart, just like these two are far apart from each other. And this is how it originally was. So from this distance to this distance, that's the impedance change from here to here or from here to there. So on a TDR trace, you'll see right here, there's a splice right there, right? Or a splice or a transformer. So the difference between the two is if you have multiple of these on there, your transformer is typically a higher impedance value up and down because as you saw here, there's a larger gap in between the two where this is a shorter gap. So it's kind of easy to determine after looking at it after a while, which one's which. So like I was saying before, you have to have two complete parallel paths itself in order to make it. I have another simulation right here I'm about to start. And so you have to have the two complete parallel paths, right? So if you don't have one, you're you're going to get an abrupt end. So you need to know if whenever you have your TDR signature, is this going to actually meet my expectations? Is this is this really 500 foot? How come my TDR showing me 200, right? So if it doesn't meet your expectations, that means more than likely, especially if you have unjacketed cable, there might be a break in the concentric neutral. So as you see here, we just ran the TDR test and that's our signature. So we have an up and down here. So this is probably a transformer, right? And as, as you can see, so you have the transmitter and the receiver it emits a pulse and reflects back. So anything beyond this high impedance mark, as you can see, it's real high, then it kind of gets low. Then you see one that's way above the others, abrupt end. Anything behind this is just a reflected echo. 
So from here, right where it branches off, to here, that, that's your actual cable length. And like I said before, it's not based on run times because it is actually calculated, not measured. You're calculating the actual run from where it's going back and forth. Going into arm and ice. So arc reflection is a two-step process. What it does, it overlays what we we're just looking at, the actual TDR, and it overlays it with a high voltage measurement, which is a pulse. So what you want to do, what it actually does is it you select the voltage value. So in this case, we had 24 kV, right? And so we want to go at least one kV over it, no more than two. And once we do that, we'll actually start the surge capacitor with a single discharge. So what it's going to do is fully ramp up to hold that voltage. Once it holds that voltage for a second, you can release the pulse if you need to manually release it, or if the system will automatically release it after it holds that voltage for one second and releases it all at once. And what that does was it makes an electrical short, as you can see here as a downward blip. It's making an electrical short from the actual center conductor itself to the concentric neutral. So it just temporarily bridges that. And it shows this in a red color because it's using high voltage instead of the low voltage TDR trace. So as you can see here, your low voltage, right? So you have your low voltage cable end here, and then you have your arc short, which is here. And then they overlay each other. So you have your high and your low voltage overlaying each other. And as you can see right there, they're mirroring each other perfectly. That's how you know you have uh, the right amount of voltage to actually get a good arc reflection. Because if you have an over voltage situation, let's say you have a flash over at 10 kV and you used 15 kV, this whole line would be elevated above the blue line. And so that means you use too much voltage and you might need to back off a couple of volts and go right here. That's why it's really good to know where your actual flash over is and use your high pipe. So as you can see right there, right at that separation point, that's going to be right where your fault, fault is flagged right there. And it's the same thing for right here. So at the cable end, right where it separates here, that's going to be your cable end. And just like the other ones, I have a, uh, a simulation built in as well. So I'm going to go ahead and start it. And what this does, it's like I said before, it's combined in both your high voltage and your low voltage pulse. So you're always going to have to search for the cable end itself. So you're going to have to do the TDR shot first. So the arc reflection goes through a, a choke filter. And what that does, it really uh, narrows down the, the actual pulse and makes it longer to actually pick up more of the pulse. And that way you can get a better shot. And it, it's a temporary short between both the conductors. And it, it bounces off the, the low voltage pulse from the temporary arc, as you'll see here. And it doesn't take long to, to actually do the measurement. So I already have it set at 25 kV. So you'll see it ramp all the way up to 25 kV. And once you get up to 25 kV, it'll hold for about one second. It'll auto release in this case. And then boom, you have your fault here. As you can see, it pretty closely traces everything. Then afterwards it gets erratic. And that's a really good indication that sh that sharp V right here is a really good indication of where your actual fault is. And as you can see, the separation there, you actually know where it's at. These here are a few different uh, traces. This is a textbook trace right here. So it's, going, it's following it perfectly. Then you see the sharp V down. This is really good gain as in gain, so it kind of zooms in. As you can see the bottom here, you can't see the whole the whole arc reflection here because the gain's too zoomed in. So you need to back off the gain, and that's something you'll have to manually do. And the, the software is pretty good at uh, automatically adjusting everything, but it is software. Sometimes it doesn't get everything 100%. So that's where uh, knowing when to adjust your gain, especially in this situation when you can't see everything, you just go over to the cogwheels, adjust your gain back a little bit, look at it, and you'll be able to see the whole picture like this. This one right here, you can see it used a little, probably a little bit too much voltage, but you still have where the fault is. And on this one, this is uh, another scenario where the actual 
center conductors burnt in the clear or not 100% burnt in the clear, but like in an aluminum cable that was burnt all the way back. And it's uh, there's enough gap from the center center conductor to the concentric neutral where it flashes over. So let's say it was an 800 foot cable, you saw 541, and then you did the arc reflection, and you see, or you see uh, 330 because 541's at right here, 430 is the actual end of the cable there. So whenever you did the arc reflection, you see 430 here. That's probably because it's burnt back at that situation, or you might have a problem inside a transformer where the elbow blew off and it's laying against the tank. Going into current decoupling, it, this is a, another method if arc reflection do, does not work. So what it does is by decoupling the actual current signal from the HV return, uh, actual isolation is obtained for the distance between the two, and I'll show you here in a second as well, the, the two adjacent and similar peaks is the actual fault distance. And how it does it actually uh, decouples the current by going through a CT or a coil. So on this, be sure that you actually subtract the, uh, test, link, uh, the test leads of the actual distance because it's going to give you distance at the top. And this test is really, really good on paper insulated cable and very very long long cable so it it's a it's another really good method on uh different applications so i'm gonna go ahead and start this right here so whenever the flashover results it makes actual current wave along the hv return which is inductive and and it decouples and the radar is actually in a tra transient wave wave shape so the transient wave shape uh, travels back and forth between the fault and the actual thumper itself, so it loops within the thumper because uh, uh, the high voltage switch is closed to the capacitor switch, and the, that's how the oscillation returns. So it bounces back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and and uh, like I said before, it's really good for paper insulated uh, cable because the the actual burning sensation that it happens helps iodize it. And as you can see here, what I'm doing is I'm shifting the trace and you're just picking two hill points. So two mountaintops. And whenever you get like a nice clean, see how this, you can't really see anything. So you see right here from point to point, and that's your distance, but you have to subtract your actual uh, test leads from this distance to get the actual uh, fault distance. So uh, like I said, this is really, really good for extremely long cables. And this is good when arc reflection has its uh, limitations on extremely long cables. We'll go into thumping. So why do we use thumping? So thumping itself is just to make a loud noise. You, you wanna find where the fault is. You wanna walk up to it, point on the ground, say, hey, it's right here. You know, uh, stomp your boot in it, put an X on it. This is where we're gonna dig. So. When the flashover occurs, what you're doing is, like I mentioned many times before, you're actually, it's a high resistance fault and you're flashing from the center conductor itself back over to the concentric neutral. So when the, uh, whenever you're doing this, it releases a high voltage and high frequency pulse, right? So you have a high energy. By high energy, we'll talk about this here in a minute, which is joules, and that's what gives your actual audible noise. So, the surge capacitor is actually discharged in cycles, and most of y'all know this because you have a timer. How long does it take to charge up the uh, actual capacitor itself and then discharge? And so the flashover is, uh, ha when the flashover happens, it actually makes an electrical magnetic field and a sound. This does not go through the filter like the arc reflection does. If you had a small length of cable and you had a fault right there, so you drilled a little hole in it, you can literally hear the difference between the two at the same voltage between the filter and no filter. So this must be performed at voltages above the breakdown voltage and do not over thump. By over thump, I mean, uh, let's say it's you and your coworker, so it's two of y'all. You're going just to pinpoint it, so it's already restoration, everything's back up. This is a week or two weeks or a month later, and you're going to repair the cable. So 
what you'll typically do is you walk through all the process that we just did. We'll do the high pot, we'll do the arc reflection, and then whenever you're at the thumping part, don't set the thumping there, start thumping and then walk to the location. What you wanna do is have your coworker walk, you know, let's say I've been using this example, 500 foot cable, faults at 250 foot, have him walk about 250 foot out if he wants to wheel it off or just count paces and then call you when you're in position and then start the actual thumper itself. That minimizes the actual thumping time that you're having on the cable. Instead of starting it, take you 10, 15 minutes to walk over to the location and you've been thumping that whole entire time. And it also gives you indication of you might need to raise the voltage up a little bit more or if there is no flash over uh, that, that may have occurred. So good things about the thumper. So you, you wanna make the noise, right? And so in order to make the noise, which is joules, you have to have two things, either voltage or capacitance. So the way you get the joules is voltage squared times capacitance divided by two. And your capacitance of the thumper itself needs to be roughly five to 10 times greater of the actual cable's capacitance. That way you can fully charge the cable and still have extra capacitance to make the noise, right? And so there's only two different ways to adjust this. So you can adjust your voltage or your capacitance. So if you had a test van or whatever you have, so let's say you have a 15 kV cable since we've been using that a lot. So 15 kV cable, but you have a, uh, let's say a, a 30 kV thumper, right? A 32 kV thumper. And you do you really wanna raise the voltage and put 30 kV, full 30 kV on a 15 kV rated thumper? Of course not. So what you wanna do is increase the capacitance. And the way you can increase the capacitance is by adding another layer of capacitor. So you have a single, like I was saying before, so let's say in this situation you have 20 kV, you get a thousand joules, right? That's the noise you need to actually pinpoint. But at the same time, if, like I said, on that 15 kV cable flashed over at, you know, 10, you're only outputting 250 because it's a quarter of the joules at half the voltage on a single stage. But if you have dual stage, so at 10 kV with one capacitor in, you have your, uh, you have your thousand joules. And then at 20 kV, with both of these in in uh, in series with each other, you'll have your thousand joules as well. So you can get the same output of noise, right? At both ranges, at 10 and at 20. Other thumpers may have three stages. So you might have the eight, 16 and 32. You know, other ones might have four stages, four, eight, 16 and 32. So you can get the same amount of joules at four kV, eight kV, 16 and 32 in that aspect. So <clears throat> this is another way of looking at a couple of different things. So you can say this picture right here is your actual capacitance, your actual thumper, right? So, and this is the cable capacitance and then the water overflowing is the capacitance to make your joules and noise, right? And so you're using more than enough to overcome the actual capacitance of the cable and produce more noise. At the same aspect, you can use this as an over voltage, over voltage situation on a single capacitor system. So this is your 30 kV on your 15 kV cable. And as you're pouring it, this right here is the excess voltage that's bleeding off and damaging your cable. So that lets you know that thumper doesn't need to be oversized. So just because you have a 15 kV cable, you might still need to thump at 8 kV or 7 kV because like I said before, typical faults are between 4 and 8 kV on a 15 kV cable. The joules equals to noise. And for uh, underground cable, it's typically 4 to 500 joules itself to actually make the noise. And as you can see here, you can see where the joule buildup is for it. And since it's using the dual capacitor, we're using 1600 joules to actually thump. Right, so it's building the actual voltage, builds the joules, then it outputs. And for manhole and network systems, wind farms, paper insulated lead, you may need 15 to 35 kV, uh, uh, 35 joules to actually be sufficient to actually find in it, right? Because the threshold is only 300 to, to 400 joules to actually hear it. And that's why most of our units go to four to five on the smaller ones and then our larger goes as you saw here 
25 kV goes to 16, which is over the threshold. And another thing is when I was showing you before, the very low energy makes it very difficult to pinpoint. And so by pinpoint, I mean to actually locate it in the ground. So there's the uh, electromagnetic and acoustic. A lot of people call it thunder or lightning because the lightning's getting hit and then you hear the thunder, right? Or it's also called the coincidence method. So what this does is time the actual the actual electromagnetic pulse and then the sound wave. So what that means is as soon as the thumper sends the voltage down the cable, the equipment will pick up the actual voltage and then it'll start the timer until the actual acoustic sound gets to the actual digiphone itself. So this is not easily fooled by conduit. And the, the stronger the signal before the fault, right? And the weaker after. So as you're walking up, to the fault, it gets it gets stronger as you're going. So what this does is, let's say you're in position, your coworker's in position, he's standing there listening for the fault, he doesn't hear it because it might be under a parking lot, right? And you're like, man, I'm I'm going, I you know this is a, let's say we have an 8 kV uh, thump or 16 kV thumper, we're using an 8 kV because the flash over is at seven. So we're thumping at eight and we're still using 1600 joules, but we can't find it. So we're maximizing our joules without maximizing, with uh, minimizing our voltage output on it, right? Where it still can make a flash out. So that also reduces uh, stress on the, on the cable, but whenever you're actually pinpointing, you can't hear it, that's when you need to turn off the machine, get your digiphone or any listening device that you had, and then you can actually listen for the actual cable itself. And so you need the, the, the leads actually increase the overall uh, system reliability by, rely, by the increased reliability. I mean, you can hear through the, con, uh, the, con, uh, the conduit, the concrete, and if you're by a busy highway, this is not gonna be, get fooled by just listening for it because everybody knows when you listen for it in a conduit, it starts echoing out the end of the conduits and not right where the pinpoint is, right, right, right where the fault is. And so you have your lightning and thunder. So as I was telling you before, you have your fault right here. And then as soon as it goes, as soon as it re reads the actual, uh, the actual uh, EM, the electromagnetic pulse on there, it starts a timer. And then as soon as it hits it, then that's right when it uh, gives you the actual calculation on where the actual fault is. And so if you're walking above ground right here, right, and you're walking, it's like 10 foot, you know, you walk up a little bit, five foot, and you walk a little bit, and you're like 10 foot, you're like, oh, I passed it. And you walk back five foot, it's telling you five foot because it's five foot underneath you, but that doesn't mean get a back hole and just try to get that whole five foot in one swoop. Another method for pinpointing, and uh, this right here is the earth spike. It's mostly used for sheath or secondary. You can use this as well for uh, if you have a unjacketed cable and you're not getting a good flashover or a flashover at all. You can use this because it's going to be bleeding the voltage out here. And you can use the actual step potential and that's what this uses. So the best way to do it is on this. This is even more highly recommended to actually trace the cable path on this as well. And the reason doing so is so you can be close as possible to the cable. That way you can, uh, for the unexpected routes. So as you can see, you'll lead with your uh, black lead and you'll go forward towards the fault. And these are your earth spikes. And so as you're getting closer, you're moving closer and closer, closer and closer. You can actually see it on the readout and this picks up the millivolts, right? The actual step potential on the earth. And so, <coughs> excuse me. So, uh, which each, each uh, couple of DC poles, when it flows through the actual ground itself and it's positioned in the fault, which forms the, the voltage gradients right in here, as you can see it in the picture, th this step voltage itself is, can be measured on the actual surface. So if you look back, th these probes can go pretty deep in the ground. So you don't want to uh, overstake them, especially if it's a shallow buried uh, cable as well. So just put enough, just put enough in there. It's kind of by judgment to see where your actual uh, voltage gradients comes in, and you can see where you pass it because you're leading, you're you're checking the 
the voltage right in between these two probes. So as you can see here, you can see a little bit more coming up more, and then you passed it because it was right in between the red and the black. And then when you pass it, it's more on the red side now. And it's ideal to actually walk parallel to the cable path. So just go like about a foot out from the cable wherever you traced it. Just go about a foot out. And then whenever you get to the point where you don't see it anymore, so it's more you're leading with the black, so it's more on this end saying go further. Go This one, there's nothing there. And you pass it and you say no, go back. Then you can turn. And as you can see, it's leading with you. Then you're right over it. And then if you pass it, you're right there. So once you're right here, you'll put the stake in the ground and usually go in a 360 circle to verify it's right there. And finally, the summary. Everybody's been waiting for this. So every fault is different. You need to know that. The whole reason for cable fault location is to actually get the job done safely first and effectively. Arc reflection works most of the time. If you can't arc reflect, try ice. This is for direct buried cable. There's a four step process. As I said, I recommend uh, tracing the actual cable path itself. And then afterwards, or if you don't do it, just uh, at least do the high pot, see where it flashes over from. Once you get a good flash over, you can do your arc reflection for your pre-location or your actual uh, ice method. And then after that, with that same number that you got from uh, high pot, just remember use one to two KV over. You can use arc reflection and then go into pinpoint. And when you utilize this method, it really cuts down on the fault location time. And uh, also you need to know when to use your listening devices and or earth spikes and which scenario that you need. All right, Michael, that's it for me. I'm giving it to you. All right, excellent. So at this time, the presentation portion of our webinar is officially concluded. We'll now take some time to answer as many of your questions as possible. Uh, if you have any questions, please submit them now into the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, for those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon our future webinars. On that survey, there's a field where you can also request a demo or a quote on any mega products. A copy of this presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars, as well as register for upcoming webinars on our website at us.megger.com forward slash webinars, and register for our webinar on December 3rd, titled How to Perform Battery Discharge Testing, presented by Daniel Carreño. All right. Let's jump into our questions. The first one I have, I'm going to be directing to our panelist, Jason Aaron. Jason, could the high pot test further damage a cable? And when should we say no for the high pot test? Okay, so this is a good question. Um, first of all, whenever we talk about the high pot test or the high potential test, we're not talking about it in the same uh, context as whenever we test power cables. We're talking about this in the context of that it's a high potential test and meaning that um, we're applying a high voltage to the cable and we're doing this to find uh, the breakdown point of the cable. Um, there's a few reasons why we wanna do this. Um, one thing is that we wanna verify that we actually have a bad cable. Um, that way we can verify that we're on the correct cable that we're trying to locate our fault on because we don't want to thump a good cable and essentially cause damage to a good conductor or to our test equipment. Additionally, we're going to use the information that we get from doing this high pot test um, for doing our uh, arc reflection techniques and doing our, our pinpointing or thumping. So uh, what we're doing whenever we do this uh, part of the test is uh, we're really applying a high voltage that ramps up to the point where the cable breaks down. So we're not putting a high voltage on a cable for a long period of time in the same manner that we do whenever we conduct a traditional DC high pot test. It's just not the same. Um, we're doing this for informational purposes to be able, to, again, to verify that our cable is bad and to use the, the voltage breakdown point for a reference whenever we do our arc reflection and then eventually perform our uh, pinpointing uh, part of the cable fault location process. So um, it's also in, uh, essential to understand that um, 
this step is extremely important whenever we do start to perform cable fault location on a cable. Um, so there's never really a point where we're going to say, excuse me, um, there is a point where we're going to say no to the test, and that's if if we do have transformers present in the system. However, uh, typically um, on a straight run of cable, uh, this is a essential part of the, the process to be able to verify that the cable is actually bad. Um, if we don't start with this procedure and verify that the cable is bad, then uh, I guess hence we could be thumping or uh, trying to do arc reflection on a good cable and therefore causing more problems than what we already have. Jason, uh, our next question is going to go over to our other panelist, uh, Glenn Wall. Glenn, you, uh, it was mentioned that the bump on the graph indicated a splice or a transformer. Can we keep the downstream transformer connected if we are testing a cable? Oh, thank you, Michael. Uh, yes, that is a that is a good question. Um, so it depends on the testing that we are performing. Uh, typically, when we are performing the high pot testing to do that breakdown test, we don't want to have transformers in the circuit when we are doing that. Um, however, when we're doing something like the arc reflection method, where we are passing that uh, that high voltage uh, surge from the capacitor. Uh, through the circuit, um, we can leave the transformers connected and it won't uh, interfere with the test. Um, what will usually end up happening with that is uh, because of inductive reactance, the pulse won't um, pass through to the other cables, uh, or if it's a Y transformer on the high side, it won't uh, pass through to the ground. So when we're doing sectionalizing and we're using an arc reflection method, uh, we can do that with the transformer still connected into the circuit. Um, but as I said, typically with uh, when we're doing that breakdown test, uh, we don't want to have the transformer connected. Thanks, Glenn. Um, back over to Jason. DC high pot testing was referenced to find breakdown instead of VLF testing. Is this because you are testing the fault and not performing a withstand test? Is VLF withstand testing an option for initial testing? Okay, so there's kind of a couple of things that we have to consider uh, whenever we're actually talking about our cable that's reached this failure point, right? Um, so we have a we have a uh, a conductor and the conductor has failed and we're trying to figure out basically how to approach that process now. VLF is a good way to verify whether or not a cable has reached a point of breakdown. Um, that's the whole point of VLF withstand testing. Um, however, like I said, whenever I spoke about the last question, um, the DC high pot that's built into our thumpers, we're not using it in the same manner that we're, um, whenever we do cable testing for diagnostic purposes. What we're trying to do is we're applying a DC, um, a DC voltage to verify the breakdown point of the cable. And we're using this for information purposes for whenever we perform arc reflection or we perform uh, the pinpointing or thumping process on the cable. And the reason we need to know uh, this information is because we don't want to apply more voltage to a cable than what is absolutely necessary. And the reason for this is because we're doing this process to find the point in the cable that is bad to hopefully uh, be able to locate it and repair it and put the cable back in service. So we want to limit the amount of stress that we put on the remaining insulation of the cable. So um, in the question it asks if VLF is a good option for initial testing. Um, yes, it is, but typically you don't need a separate piece of equipment to do a VLF withstand test because we have it built in to the equipment. Um, typically, you would do the VLF withstand testing to do um, for diagnostic purposes on a service age cable or for acceptance testing uh, purposes on a brand new cable. And if you get to a point where your reach breakdown while you're doing that VLF withstand test, that's whenever you're going to move on to your cable fault location process. And we have all of these techniques 
built into one piece of equipment to avoid having to have multiple pieces of equipment to be able to perform the cable fault location process on the cable that we've already identified that's uh, failed through um, doing that VLF withstand testing or um, in other cases, uh, if the cable may have failed under um, operating conditions. Thanks. Uh, our next question is going over to Glenn. Glenn, when do you make a call to replace the entire cable over partial replacement? Uh, so that can be a tricky question. Um, there's there's a lot of factors that might go into that, uh, uh, depending on the age of the cable in question, um, how critical the load is that it's feeding, um, how many splices it might already have in it, how many times it's already failed, um, how uh, how difficult it would be to replace, you know, whether it's in conduit or if it's direct buried cable, um, all those can kind of tie in um to making that determination uh and so typically a lot of the times what ends up happening is there is gonna there there ends up being a cost breakdown on the amount of time and cost to replace the cable versus uh potentially continuing to repair it um and you know the 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 length of the cable can be a factor so there are many different things that can go into that and it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis Thanks, Glenn. Uh, back over to our presenter, Joseph. Uh, Joe, do you recommend not testing through transformers? Also, what do you recommend for locating under roads and driveways, drilling holes in the asphalt? So when you're talking about testing through a transformer, uh, you can arc reflect through a transformer. Try not to uh, high pot through it because you might blow some fuses unintentionally. So whenever you arc reflect, this is more of a restoration type question than a cable fault locating. That's why I didn't mention that in the presentation. So whenever you arc reflect, you can arc reflect because it's going through that choke filter that I mentioned. And that will give you the indications of where where the transformers and or splices are located in the cable. And from there, it'll help you during the restoration process to pinpoint, hey, it's in between transformer two and three. I can go to three, shoot backwards to two, verify that it is in between two and three, then shoot back from three to four or five and onwards and verify there's not more than one fault in there. And so that's what I mean. You can test through transformers. It's just arc reflection, not thump and not high pot, just arc reflection. And for the recommenda uh, recommendations for locating under roads and driveways, that's why I was saying that's where you need your listening devices. So like our Digiphone that I was mentioning before, it's not fooled by your driveways or uh, conduits or roads. The reason being because it's going to pick up the electromagnetic pulse. And then as soon as it hears that, sees that pulse, it's going to start a timer. And then as soon as that audible sound gets to it and it picks that up, it's going to give you a distance to the fault. And you can actually hear it through there because it's really sensitive equipment at the same time. And you can actually hear the, the, pinpoint so it'll give you an actual distance to it on our digital display so you'll know because you'll see the actual fault distance on the display the actual signal strength will increase as well and it'll tell you that you're right over the, the actual fault even though it's over the driveway and that way you minimize especially in a driveway or parking lot you want to minimize that trench that you're digging and that's a really good tool to to do so Thanks, Joe. Our next question is over to Glenn. Glenn, can you use an insulation resistance test instead of a high pot to determine the condition of the cable before locating a fault? So um, I would say in theory, yes, you could, um, depending on the breakdown voltage level of the cable fault in question. Uh, typically, insulation resistance test sets have certain ranges such as 5 kV, 10 kV, 15 kV, um, and they're both DC. Uh, a um, insulation resistance test set and a um, DC high pot operate in the same way. It's just about what level that they can reach. So if the breakdown voltage level of the fault was less than the um, the voltage output of that uh, insulation resistance test set, in theory, yes, that could be done. 
Um, it would be less convenient, however, I would say, because on our thumpers, um, the AC or the DC high pot is a, is an integrated piece of it. So, um, in order to use that uh, uh, insulation resistance test set, now you'd have to swap the leads over and whatnot, or do that first and then uh, disconnect it, and then uh, install the leads on the uh, thumper to the cable under test. So um, you could, uh, but it would probably be just more um, convenient and more a better use of time to use the integrated high pot. All right, thanks, Glenn. Uh, next is back over to Joe. Joe, what testing procedures are available for low voltage cables, such as those less than 600 volts? So that, that's a really good question. At the end, I was talking about the earth spikes that's typically used for uh, low voltage cables or secondary. And uh, it, it all kind of depends because if, if it's just a true secondary and you do not have a return path, you cannot use arc reflection. But we have equipment like uh, the Easy Thump 3, which you have a dual capacitor at 1.5 kV and 3 kV. So you can output 500 joules at 1.5 kV. So if you actually did have a, uh, let's say an armored cable, you can actually use that to arc reflect down it and it'll flash back over and you use the actual armor from the cable as a return path like you would for a concentric neutral. But if you do not have that, or if it's a, if it's in a conduit of metal conduit, you can use the metal conduit as the return path as well. But if you do not have any of those, you're going to be limited to actually using the earth spikes. And that's why it's going to be really, really good to actually uh, trace the cable path in that aspect. And if you're over, let's say, concrete, just make sure that you can still use the earth spikes on there because it will actually travel through the concrete because concrete's conductive. And those usually come with uh, sponges on there. So make sure the sponges are wet, put them over the spikes and then you and wet the concrete. And you can actually pinpoint that way as well. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and next is over to Jason. Jason, how do lower voltage thumpers behave when dealing with a cable network? Okay, um, this question is kind of general, but I'm going to attempt to to answer it. So, um, I guess in general, whenever we talk about thumpers, um, it's important to understand that the voltage that we're applying um, is in reference to ground. And you heard Joe speak about uh, 15 kV cables uh, where they typically break down at is between 4 and 8 kV. Now, we know that the 15 kV cable is rated in terms of phase-to-phase -phase voltage. However, whenever you um, take that value and uh, you divide it by the square root of 3, you'll be able to get your phase-to-ground voltage. And um, that's typically somewhere um, around, I think it's 8.3 or 8.6 kV um, off the top of my head. And um, so what we're trying to do though with this, with our thumpers is we want to find that range within that, um, where the breakdown is, where um, it may find in within that uh, four to eight kV. And we want to apply only a high enough voltage that's necessary to be able to find the, the issue with the cable. And, um, with any of our thumpers that you're using, you know, it, they have all of these features that you can use, but it's important to understand that um, we only need to use the features that are necessary to be able to find the fault. And in some cases, we're not going to be able to apply all of those features. So in, in that aspect, the, the idea or the philosophy is that it's a, a toolbox method where we have all these different tools that are within our toolbox to be able to apply uh, for this cable fall location process. And um, so you want to make sure that you size the thumper appropriately to the cable that um, you want to uh, perform the CFL process on. However, again, we want to do so in terms where we're limiting the amount of stress that we place on the cable. Because again, the entire idea is to find the fault, repair it, and um, place the conductor back in service so that we can have a long cable life without having to worry about it. All right, thanks, Jason. 
Uh, it looks like that's all the questions we have today. Uh, if you think of anything else, please feel free to contact us offline. Uh, but as a reminder, I'd like to tell everyone that we will be sending out a copy of this presentation, uh, your certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar in about two business days. Uh, but thank you all for attending. If you could, please remember to take our survey at the end of this. Uh, that survey will include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. But once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and I hope you all have a great weekend.